Welcome back, everybody. We are excited to be coming back with another edition of the Wisconsin 4-H Clover Connections videos. Today, we are being joined by a colleague and friend uh, from Pierce County, Frank Ginther, who's the 4-H Youth Development Educator um, over in Pierce County. Um, and Frank, you're joining us today because we've been getting a lot of questions um, from 4-H leaders, even from some staff sometimes about club decision making. And so we're gonna pick your brain um, and we wanna hear a little bit of information from you about some, some, some topics that might be related to making decisions. Excellent. So um, the first thing, I'm gonna shoot the first question to you, Frank. Um, we have said for years that this is not my 4-H club and it's not your 4-H club, it's kind of our 4-H club. And when we say that we're talking about members and leaders and families, they own it. Um, but I'm hoping you can talk to us a little bit about how important it is to engage our members in the club and in all of the club activities? Sure, yeah, um, well, it really comes down to um, a question like that really takes my brain over to the youth and adult partnership category. Um, and so really understanding the value of relationship building between youth and adults in a club will really help facilitate that, I think, Melinda. So if you can uh, really start to understand even some of the very basics about youth-adult partnerships, and uh, adults need to learn to understand a little bit about how youth function, and youth definitely need to understand about how adults function, because we need to be able to get along in this, um, in this process. And uh, so I think if you can get a good base in youth-adult partnership kind of just thoughts and, and attitudes, um, that can go a long way to help uh, promote the Our Club kind of uh, process. And then you can start to get into some other kinds of things, some actual decision-making methods um, where you're actually empowering certain people to do certain things. Another thing is, is I just think communication is just a really important tool. I often will um, suggest to club leaders uh, you know, have you sat down with your club officers and just had a talk about what you're going to do this month? Have you just set aside a little in these days, you know, Zoom time and just had your officers together and let them talk and you talk and, you know, you present the information you have and let them talk and, and see what you can come up with together for an agenda. And that, that will help, I think, also promote some, some of that process of it feeling more like our club versus one or the other. Great. Thanks, Frank. Um, sure. So I, I, you spoke a little bit about it. What are some of those ways that clubs can make decisions, some of those like actual practical ways that they can do it? Yeah, well, um, the most classic um, way that uh, clubs actually make decisions and bodies, or they're actually the, the really official name for a group that uses uh, the old parliamentary procedure tactics are called deliberative assemblies. That's kind of a cool name, but um, and we wouldn't even probably think of our 4-H clubs that way, but they certainly can be. Um, and uh, I would say about 95%, anywhere between 85 and 95% of bodies around the world, legislative and group and club and organizational bodies, if they're going to get into some sort of techniques of making decisions, they're using parliamentary procedure. So, but there are other ways certainly to do that. And I think one of the key differences is to is to be able to think about this this idea of consensus building and how you might build a consensus in a group and so the real difference is is parliamentary procedure it and and we might talk about that a little bit more detail down the road here but i think it's it, it really want it wants you to present an issue out there and then kind of have the debate around it. Whereas consensus kind of brings the debate along. So you're sort of having the debate along while you're talking about the issue. And then gradually you're hammering out little bits and pieces here and there to see, oh, we might need to change here. We might need to get collaborative here or get or compromise here. And uh, so I think those are probably two of the key uh, techniques that you might use, consensus building or this, this more formal thing called parliamentary procedure. Um, the other thing is, is that sometimes groups can make some other ideas and plans um, that, uh, that are maybe just a little bit different, and that's really up to the group. So that's, again, where that communication comes in, and the group is just going to decide, you know, well, we're going to decide things by, um, you know, uh, just having... Uh, committees take care of things, which you can refer to 
in parliamentary procedure, or you can you can be a little more informal about that too. So, but the two kind of classic ways that you're going to be making decisions are probably consensus building or parliamentary procedure. And it kind of depends on how you drag the debate along, if you drag it along with the issue or if you're more formal about putting the issue out there. You know, Frank, I think you brought up some really good points. And we've heard the word parliamentary procedure a lot throughout our conversation today. But what if somebody doesn't know how to use that? Do I have to use that in my club? Or is there maybe some abbreviated ways that we can do some different things? So what are your thoughts on that? Sure. Um, well, it, first of all, it, it is a remarkably old um, way of making decisions. I think it goes back to about the 1500s and it comes from British parliamentary law. And so it, it's, got some, it's got some roots to it. So, and I think one of the things you really need to think about is how, and this is gonna sound sort of weird, but how unruly is the group? How unwieldy is the group? I mean, parliament procedure was really invented uh, so that groups that were really unwieldy and, and, and unruly to have some order, you know, and that's why they use the book, Robert's Rules of Order. And uh, it was actually, that book wasn't written until the, the late 1800s, till about 1876. And that book was written by actually a military man whose last name was Robert. And he um, saw this happening in organizations that he was in, in the San Francisco area. So that's a little history behind it. Now, there are pieces that you can master pretty easily. I think if you just can get some basics about um, getting people comfortable with um, moving motions, so getting, think, getting them to think about how you move the issue forward, not make the issue move forward, but move that issue forward. Um, getting people to be comfortable with how you might refer things over to committee groups, because that can move the agenda along, so you don't kind of spill over to a consensus discussion, which just goes on and on and on. Um, and then you kind of lose where you're at with your parliamentary procedure. Um, I think basic voting, just doing some practicing and sometimes with different kinds of skills. It, maybe it's a visual vote with a hand raise. Um, it doesn't always have to be just a vocal kind of a vote. Um, there's lots of other ways you can do basic voting. I mean, um, where people show a preference standing up, sitting down, um, you know, uh, maybe putting something in a, you can vote by putting something into a, a certain, you know, one side of a, of a container or another. So I'm going to vote this way, or I'm going to vote that way. So if you can get some of those basic things about moving issues forward, and then doing some basic voting, that really gets your feet wet. And then now you can start to get into a few more things. And then I think adjourning also, learning how to formally end your meeting. So if you, those are some pretty basic steps that you, can, that you can do. And in some ways, I think they're a little bit easier to learn than consensus. Cons consensus requires a lot of talking and compromising along the way and a lot of discussion. And often we're finding that young people aren't comfortable saying a lot. So if you can get them to master some basic Parley Pro words, you can do quite a bit with, with just doing some basic things. Frank, I love the line of moving the agenda forward because that really helps as we think about when people make a motion and they say, I move. Now I know why they say I move instead of, you know, everyone learned I make a motion. So I'm curious about who makes the club decisions. Is it the parents or the leaders? Who does that? Well, I think, Marie, it's really, um, again, a combination. There are some decisions that probably do need to be made more exclusively by adults. I mean, you know, if you've got a bunch of younger kids, they can't decide who's going to drive. I mean, because they don't drive, right? So, I mean, they're not going to be able to really intel, I mean, you know, not, not efficiently really make that decision. But I think when it comes to some basic things about, you know, spending some money, or, um, you know, deciding if a club's going to have an event or deciding to accept an idea that, um, that somebody has in the club and try to move forward with that idea. I think young people can really work together to do that with a little coaching and help from adults as well. So that takes me back to kind of what I said at the beginning is learning about those youth adult partnership kinds of relationships, how to really get some good communication going, build some trust, have some basic meetings ahead of time with officers or with groups who are working on a small committee. And then I think you'll find that decisions can really be made 
um, pretty uh, much by youth in our organizations with some coaching and help from adults. And um, I, I mean, we don't want everybody, we don't want the club, you know, spending every penny they have on, you know, candy, you know, on the first meeting, you know, just because they have $500. So I think um, being ready to coach along the way and having that, those communication lines open, build some trust and get them to try some of these techniques and ease them into it. I think it can really be a great partnership. Frank, I want to thank you for joining us for this edition of Clover Connections. I think we could probably do a couple more videos, deeper dives into some of these things. I've learned a ton. Um, and sure. and I, I think I came in knowing a little bit. So if you've got questions about how to do any of those things that Frank has just mentioned, remember that we are all here for you. Um, and uh, make sure you join us next time for our next edition of Clover Connections.